Come on, let's trip. Okay, there you go. Um, so the International Becoming an Outdoorsman program, uh, they were founded um, um, in Stevens Point where I went to school. And um, I, I was affiliated with that program when I was in school. And when they found out that I was leading Eco Adventures for Women, uh, the BOW program contacted me and said, would you like to do BOW in the Bahamas? Now, Becoming an Outdoors Woman is tailored to the beginner. And they do, a, they do weekend workshops, not just in Wisconsin, but in many states all over the United States. And the BOW destination programs were similar in the fact that they are set up to, uh, uh, for the beginner. And also that uh, they're, they're non-competitive learning environments. So women could step outside their comfort zone and experience extraordinary adventures in places maybe they didn't think they could go to or doing things they didn't think they could do. So the transition from my student programs to women's programs was really easy because um, women like to tr travel with like-minded people and women, at least the women that go on my trips, love to learn. Uh, so. Um, like I said, I started off doing marine biology trips in the Sea of Cortez, uh, and then I, my second trip was in Alaska. But now on this slide here, you'll see we have 12 destinations. And you know why I have 12 destinations? It's because women on my, the, the women on my trips are going, where are we going to next, Tara? And then I was like, I got ideas. <laughs> so all of these trips are places that I wanted to, uh, places I wanted to go and things I wanted to experience. And then I, found people to go do them with me. And, um, and uh, yeah, this all started from just a passion of, of exploring. And now my passion is helping others connect with wild places. So Green Adventures, it's called Green Adventures because I wanted to create um, sustainable tourism that help protect people, places, and ecosystems. And as long as I can remember, I, a quote that I, I uh, memorized when I was 18 years old was this by Aldo Leopold from his book called The Sand County Almanac. And he said, we abuse land because we see it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we all belong, it's then we'll begin to use it with love and respect. And that's the the philosophy that I've built all of my tours around. It's not about doom and gloom. It's about how can I help you fall in love? Because when you fall in love with it, you ultimately want to protect it. And then we also try to give you tangible ways that you can make a positive difference for the places that you travel to, um, no matter where you live. And all the trips are carbon neutral as well through our partners, carbonfund.org. So as I said, our mission is to help people fall in love with wild places through extraordinary eco-adventures to help protect people, places, and ecosystems through sustainable tourism. So tonight, the presentation, as you know, is on Uganda, the Pearl of Africa. And um, this also comes back to uh, a dream I had, uh, like a, a, a passion. When I was a, a teenager, and I'm sure like many of you, when you saw uh, Gorillas in the Mist, um, you know, you wanted to one day see gorillas. And I knew that I would see them in the wild. I just didn't know how. Africa was never has never really been on my horizon uh, in terms of a place that I was going to right away. I, I, I didn't really want to even go to Africa unless I was going to see the mountain gorillas. And so flash forward 20 some, 25 years, a friend and I were talking about places to go run marathons, right? And uh, she was like, I, I was scrolling through a, a list of places to run marathons. I said, let's go to Uganda and run a marathon. And she's like, I'm not running a marathon in Uganda. <laughs> and I, it's, I'm sure it's because she had the same kind of misconception I did. Maybe like, maybe like, oh, maybe it might be too dangerous. Like what kind of facilities do they have there? Uh, but I kid you not, a week later, I was visiting with a friend who her job is to put people like me in touch with outfitters in amazing destinations. And she said, Tara, do you want to go to, what are you doing in April? She said, this is April. This was January of, of 2018. She's like, what are you doing in April? I said, I don't know. She goes, do you want to go to Uganda? And I said, well, I get to see the mountain gorillas. And she's like, yes. I said, sign me up. So I flew to Uganda and I had no idea, no, no preparation other than what I found on the internet. And I fell in love with Uganda. And I was there and I said, everybody needs to do this. So now uh, I've been there three times. 
Uh, we would have done four, but 2020 postponed everything. Uh, when we, uh, I typically lead this trip in April of, of the year. And so uh, as we know what happened in March, things started to shut down. So a lot of things were postponed to 2021. And in 2021, I led all international trips. That one was canceled, even with the various change in COVID regu regulations. We flew, uh, I, I started with Mexico and did all the Africa trips as well. Um, so where is Uganda on the map here? Um, so Uganda is, um, it's, it's considered an Eastern, uh, uh, a, East African country, and it's bordered by Kenya, Tanzania, Congo, and um, and it's got uh, uh, Lake Victoria. It's and it's also bordered by Lake Victoria and the Nile. So I'm going to go over some of the, the 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 nuts and bolts first before we get to the pretty pictures. Getting to Uganda, so pretty much any major airline will get you to Entebbe. That's where the trip starts and ends is Entebbe. And um, you could uh, fly United or Delta, um, American. Those are going to go to hub cities in Europe uh, or Africa. And then you're going to uh, partner with, they're going to, you're going to get on one of their partners and you're going to fly down to Entebbe. So uh, a lot of people will connect through Brussels or Amsterdam. Um, I took Ethiopia Airlines from Chicago, where I live, and I, it was a direct flight, 13 hours to um, Addis Ababa, and, um, and then it was two hours from uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, to Entebbe, and I really liked that flight a lot, and I'm, I'm going to probably do that again. Um, so uh, um, so those, those are some options, going through Ethiopia or going through the Netherlands. You can expect, though, about 24 hours of travel. It's a pretty long day. And when you book your flights, so let's say the trip starts on April 14th, you need to book your flight. Um, uh, you need to book your flight to uh, on April 13th um, to arrive on the 14th. And then uh, the cost is about $900 to $1,300 round trip uh, from North America. Uh, so it's actually pretty reasonable. Um, and, um, and, and average is, we, we were even finding flights for $840. So it really depends on what type of seats you want and, and your schedule. But I provide a specific travel parameters once the trip is confirmed. So each trip needs X amount of people to, um, to, to run. And so um, we need a uh, nine for the women's trip. Uh, and uh, so once we get our nine confirmed, then um, I send out a trip welcome letter with a packing list and detailed travel parameters. And some people are savvy enough to book on their own. Uh, and some people just would feel are savvy, but would feel much more comfortable for a travel agent to do it. So I partner with the travel agency. They're called Ridgebrook Travel. Right? Um, they're out of a suburb here in Chicago. They book all my group travel for my students. At Gail is the travel agent, and for twenty five bucks each flight, so a round trip flight, it would work. Um, it she will book your flight, and you get the same prices you would probably find from a consolidator online. Uh, but the difference is if you run into issues like flights are canceled or you're in Africa um, and uh, yeah, uh, there's a delay and a, a segment of your flight is canceled, you're not calling the airlines and sitting on hold for an hour or three or 10. You call Gail, she makes the calls for you and they have a 24 hour hotline. So uh, that's why I, I really suggest using a travel agent uh, for these big, more complicated trips, but you certainly could do it on your own. The entry and exit requirements. So the top one here is all travelers must be vaccinated with, uh, it, and that should be COVID vaccination. Sorry, there's a typo there. So all travelers must have a COVID vaccination, and that is a Green Adventures recommendation at this point. Just, and that is because I deal in group travel, and when you need X amount of people to make a group happen, everybody's relying on that X amount of people. And if we find out uh, down the down the road that COVID vaccine vaccination is required as well, and three people of that want to cancel because they don't want to get vaccinated, that's going to jeopardize the entire group. Uh, also, testing is getting much more complicated for unvaccinated travelers because everybody regardless of where they're at in the world right now, um, will needs to take a COVID test to return back to the US. And if you're unvaccinated, you need to get that within 24 hours. In some of the places that we're at, 
we can't get a COVID test in 24 hours. We need the three day window. Um, and, and also unvaccinated travelers have to show proof that they've purchased a COVID test for return to the US. And I always say that I wanna help everybody throughout this process. And in order for me to give people the most accurate information, I have to make sure that I have the least amount of variables. And so this is why we're, we're saying that all travelers going on our trips must be vaccinated. But to get into Uganda, you need a valid passport with two blank pages. Uh, everyone going to Uganda also has to have proof of a yellow fever vaccination. This has been forever. Um, and proof of that is a yellow card. And if you are certain you want to go to Uganda, um, even if the trip isn't confirmed yet, it's going to be. But even if the trip isn't confirmed after you've signed up, don't wait until the last minute to get your yellow fever vaccine because there's delay. There's a shortage in the U.S. and there's been a shortage for a really long time. Every, everybody I know that has gone on this trip has never had a problem getting a vaccine, the uh, getting a yellow fever vaccine. But um, the short story is just don't wait. Book your book your appointment with like Passport Health or your travel, uh, the travel clinic through your doctor's office and get your yellow fever vaccine. Uh, and a tourist visa, it's $50, and I provide you information on do that. You buy it online. It's very easy. You submit some documents. They send you the certificate, and you travel with it. Uh, to uh, travel to Uganda at this time, things change all the time. But to travel to Uganda at this time, uh, you need a negative COVID PCR test taken no more than 72 hours before departure to Uganda, not arrival, departure. So that is your, like, that's a, that could be almost four days or five days if uh, if you start to put in all your travel and stuff. So it's just departure to Uganda because that, that could even be if you have a connection in Brussels uh, from Chicago, three days before you leave Chicago, you get you get your test or sooner. Um, and then you, uh, um, yeah, you fly to Brussels, you have your certificate, and then you go to Uganda. Um, one of the things that we dealt with last year, and I, I don't want to get too much in the details of it, is that some of the connection cities have their own COVID requirements, uh, uh, their COVID testing requirements, and we will help you figure that out, okay? Um, and then Uganda is now requiring a COVID rapid test upon entry for thirty dollars. So when you get to when you get to Uganda, you're going to give your uh, all your documentation and you're going to get a COVID test at the border. And then um, this is the same as last year. Everybody needs to get a, a COVID test taken no more than seventy two hours before departure. I know it's a lot. Things have changed though in terms of travel, but uh, it's it's worth the adventure. And then our promise um, is that I, I, I always say you travel solo, but not alone. So um, I, I'm going to, myself and my team will give you a lot of front loaded information. I like to give you more information so that, because uh, I know you want to know. <laughs> I do it before the trip, and I also am on the trip anticipating your questions along the way, anticipating just I'm just looking out. My job is to let you relax and I'm doing all the planning and thinking for you. Um, and uh, just to try to make it the least stressful, um, uh, you know, for you. So we'll provide you all of the, the pre-trip stuff, packing lists, uh, your entry requirements, suggestions for travel insurance. You should not go on this trip without travel insurance. Um, our team will be waiting for you when you come out of the airport. They'll be there to welcome you. Um, on site, you have 24 seven support from a Green Adventures representative. Uh, so if you have uh, if you have something you need help with, um, if there's something not right in your room, if there's whatever, whatever the ifs, you could say, um, you know, Tara, I, I, I please help me with this. I'm here for illness and accident support, too. Um, you know, when you travel, things happen. And if you have to go to a hospital, you're not going by yourself. I'm going to be there right by your side, uh, your advocate, helping helping you out, um, making calls for you. This, My very first trip to Uganda, a woman did get ill and was in the hospital. Um, and I spent a lot of time on travel insurance, um, with travel insurance, because what's great about companies like Travel Guard and um, and TravelX, both products sold on my website and available on my website, is that they have a dedicated team who will help you. So I don't have to... I don't have to figure out how to like change your flights or um, contact your doctor. 
that team is the one that makes those calls. And I'm just kind of the middleman um, to help you. But um, they, this woman was perfectly fine in the end. She flew home okay, but they were willing to send a nurse to travel with her. And I was helping to coordinate that throughout. So you're not alone. You've got a friend in Uganda. You have a friend wherever you go with Green Adventures. Um, arrange, uh, well, arrange for the necessary tests to return to, U to USA. So people ask me all the time, like, how do I get my test if I go to Uganda or if I go to Iceland? Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it for you. We'll make sure that we'll arrange a doc, like in this case, uh, last year we had a doctor come to a hotel and did the PCR test for all of us and they were hand delivered to a lab and everything was taken care of. Um, and if that's the case, we'll do that again. Um, but uh, it's not included. Testing is not included in the trip package price, but all the arrangements are made for you and you will pay the necessary people on site and we'll let you know how much things cost. And at the end, our team will be there to see you off at the airport as well. This is Paul Tamwenya, and I would have liked to have Paul on this call with me tonight, but it is, I think, 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. in Uganda right now. So that's why I'm doing a part two to this presentation. It, it's on um, Saturday at 10 a.m. Central. Paul is going to be on a Zoom call, and Paul is the local guide and the expert. I learned a long time ago. Let me just take a step back. When I started Green Adventures, I was a guide. I wanted to be the person who was teaching the classes out in the field, doing all the adventure activities. But as I started getting more and more destinations, that's not possible for me. And also, it's just not the business model I want. I don't want to be in there. I don't want to take jobs from local communities. I want to create jobs in local communities. So now what I do is hire teams in all the places we travel to that are locally operated. So the money goes to them. And Paul is one of those people in this world that I'm so glad that came into my life. Uh, he is one of the most fun, educated, open-minded um, people I've, I've ever, I've ever met. And he's, he's really, um, he really loves Uganda and he loves talking about the animals and the rest of his team, uh, um, the, the guides that he trains um, uh, that work for his company, Journeys Uganda, but also he trains guides that work for the Ugandan Wildlife um, uh, Federation too. So um, he's, he's kind of a mover and shaker in Uganda. And if there's any birders out there, Paul is your guy. He, he got started doing birding tours. Um, so, uh, and even if you're not a birding person, you will be, <laughs> you can't help but like birds in Uganda. I, we had a birder on our, one of our trips, just doing, you know, doing a bird list. Cause that's what birders do. And she had almost 300 species of birds in the 12 days that we were in Uganda. Um, and so we've got three vehicles though, not all bird, not all vehicles break for birds, but you will definitely uh, get to, to know the tiniest animals on safari to the megafauna as well. But again, so hopefully you can meet, um, you could join me on Saturday and uh, ask Paul questions. So the, the focus of my presentation is I wanna tell it, tell it from the Green Adventures perspective. I wanna like kind of go over some of the activities that we're doing and, um, and then uh, Paul could be available on Saturday to tell you about more natural history about the animals, the park specifics, how big parks are, uh, the geography. Um, he, he's the local expert. So if you you have if you have those questions, I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. But you should you should ask Paul too. Um, so the, the photo behind actually going back to this also, I was so enamored with Paul, I forgot to tell you that these are the types of vehicles we travel in. They're land cruisers. And you can see they're modified so that they have the, their, their roofs pop up. And, um, and also a little differently, um, a little differently uh, that uh, if you've been on safari to Tanzania, for example, um, is uh, uh, you can't sit on the back of the trucks. It's not, it's, that's just a rule on uh, safari in Tanzania. But in Uganda, you could sit on those the backs of those. So you're going to see quite a few photos of, of people sitting on the, the racks on the back. Now, of course, these 
are parked. And so uh, we have a participant standing here and she's the birder. Um, but uh, so inside the vehicles, there are three rows on either side and everybody has a window seat. There's no middle seats. And sometimes the passenger seat is empty and sometimes the passenger seat has a participant. Some people like to sit up front and talk to the guide. So we do move around, there's no assigned seats. And also, I think what people like about Green Adventures as well is that, like I said, we're like-minded and there's kind of these ground rules that are set ahead of time, which is really about enjoying the person, helping people enjoy their own personal space and their experience, and also making sure the animals and wildlife are taken care of. Like just real quickly, like we don't allow flash photography. You can't mimic the animals' calls and sounds. You can't bang on the cars to get their attention. Inside the vehicle, we ask the people to turn off their like the the notifications on phones and beeps and clicks on the um uh, on their cameras um because we're all having our own national geographic moment right and nothing ruins that more than like a beep beep, beep, beep uh or somebody you know carrying on a conversation so we also say you know it's it's okay to to like whisper when we're, if we see something or just just be quiet for a few minutes and let us all observe And then being able to stand up and get a 360 degree view of the animals around you. Um, I mean, that's one of the greatest things about being on safari uh, is just um, no, stopping, no, 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 no. stopping all the time to uh, to to see see those animals. Um, He's tired. If, if there's anybody He's tired, He's tired. OK. So, I know. is there anybody okay. that isn't muted on here? Just leave. I'll just wanna, okay. Oh, I can mute all. Perfect. Okay. Um, all right. So, being able to, um, yeah, look around and and move from different parts of the vehicle to get you know great photos. But one thing I'd like to point out here too is I give you a very detailed packing list. And um, I would like for you to follow that packing list. We love to, we, I do this too, if I don't plan well, I overpack and we just bring way too much stuff. And as long as you pack in advance, uh, try on everything before you put it in a bag, don't just throw things in because you're like, oh, I'll probably wear it. Most likely you won't. On these types of trips, people tend to wear the same shirts over and over again, the same pants over and over again. Uh, you can wear clothes more than once. And at some places you can even do laundry, but uh, everything needs to be packed in a 75 liter or less duffel bag, no wheels. It has to be smashable because you can see here, uh, William is pushing this into the uh, this back of the safari vehicle. Not only do we go on game drives in these vehicles, they're also our transportation from point A to point B. And uh, if we're going between hotels, it means we have our luggage and whatever doesn't fit in there fits on your lap in the in the passenger side of it people usually pack really really well so it's never been an issue with having a bunch of luggage inside uh, i love a uh, safari wear i i call it it's it's incon you, you know i know it's pretty drab uh but it's it's a line of clothing that it's inconspicuous but still turning heads okay so you can still it, you know you can still look cute in in safari clothing um and um You'll notice here, though, you have uh, a very plain color palette. It's very forest friendly is what the, the term is. And the reason why we want browns and greens and um, I'm trying gray is because when we're hiking to go see gorillas or chimpanzees, for example, we're walking through the forest and bright red jackets or bright clothing would it, poachers can see people walking through the forest and we could be leading people right to the animals that we're trying to protect so forest friendly colors you'll notice here there's absolutely no navy blue because navy blue attracts tsetse flies tsetse flies carry african sleeping sickness and um and also they hurt when they bite. So you don't want navy blue and you don't want black, but I do have black rain pants here. So we don't wear rain pants in the savannas um, or, um, where tsetse flies are. We wear rain pants and rain jackets potentially when we're in the, the, the rainforest at higher elevations, when we're um, 
in the Buindi uh, National Forest or Kibali National Forest, where it's more likely to rain, and there aren't uh, there aren't tsetse flies there. So um, you're going to want to keep your color palette to forest friendly, and avoid bright colors. And then some of the tools of the trade. Um, on my last year when I led my safari uh, both to Tanzania and Uganda, I just had my phone. I didn't use any, I had my phone and binoculars because I, I like binoculars, but you don't need super long lenses to take really great photos. You could just, most iPhones and uh, you know Samsung Android phones right now will take spectacular photos that you could share and your friends will still be jealous and, and you can have, um, you can frame them and, and keep your memories forever. Um, but if you are interested in bringing an SLR type camera, the minimum lens length that you want to get some decent like up close photos would be 300 millimeters. Um, and that's good for most of the birds on the trip, um, most of the animals. Um, if you're someone who wants like real detailed, high professional, high quality, um, bigger lenses, you could rent them from a uh, from lens renting companies um, for like a hundred bucks for the week. And that's what I did when I went to Yellowstone. Uh, and I found that it was just a pain in the butt. I can't remember how many, how, how many millimeters that lens was, but it was like the size of my arm. It was just something to lug around and be worried about. Um, so uh, I, this 300 millimeters is a perfect setup for most beginners. But you don't want to skip on skimp on binoculars. Binoculars that are eight, that's the length of this of the barrel, eight by 45, which is the diameter of the the, the opening of the lens, um, is perfect for the type of uh, animal viewing and bird watching and insects that we'd see. And you're gonna have your binoculars all the time. And right below them is I call this my bird bra. <laughs> Um, it's because I, I use my binoculars for birding, and this is the bra I use to keep my binoculars uh, from moving around, kind of like my girls. So um, I like to, uh, I, I wear that so you don't even have to worry about your binoculars. Once you stand up, you can just look, put your binoculars back on your chest. This is like 30 bucks, uh, a, a basic harness like that. Okay. That's the that's kind of the nuts and bolts of everything. Okay, so now I'm gonna kind of go over the the travel plan, and um, so you can see all the all the stops on this 12 day trip. And um, day one is a travel day. Day 12 is also a travel day. So um, everything in between is all the action days. And this is a we do about 1,500 miles of driving. I know it's 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 a lot, but you have to also know that we do spend a lot of time driving as we do game drives, which is going through the different through the parks and going through the different tracks. And you want to take advantage of as much driving through game parks as possible because that's how you see the most wildlife. But we also have segments of this trip where we might be going, let's say, uh, for example, just Entebbe to Maction Falls. It's Merch. It looks like Murchison, but it's Maction. That's six hours, a six hour ride. But we don't do the six hours all in one one stint. We'll stop halfway and go to the Zewo Rhino Sanctuary. But the point is, is that's an all day trip, you know, from Entebbe to Murchison Falls. You're going to leave Entebbe early in the morning and you're going to get to Maction Falls at about uh, right, right as the sun setting around uh, around dinner time. OK, uh, so we're, we start and end in Entebbe. We go through Kampala and up here. This is the um, uh, this is the Zewo Rhino Sanctuary is, num is letter C. And then D is the Maction Falls National Park and Maction Falls. From there, we do a real long drive. This is this is uh, six or seven hours from Maction Falls down to Kibali. And uh, this is where the chimpanzees are. Uh, F here is Queen Elizabeth National Park, which is where we look for the tree climbing lions. G is Bowindi Impenetrable Forest. H is um, uh, uh, Lake Mamboro National Park, which is the last park we go to. And then on the final day, it's about four hours from Lake Mamboro to Entebbe. I don't spend a lot of time on the places that we're staying at on this because, I mean, we've already talked for 37 minutes just on how to get to Uganda, what to bring to Uganda. So you can always go to my website and you scroll down to the bottom where the itinerary is and it says, where do we stay? You can click on all of the locations that I've been, that, that I, we stay at, and you can read about them and see photos uh, from there. 
Okay, let's talk about Mabamba Swamp. So this is so this is the very first activity you'll do on day two. So you fly in day one, day two, we explore um, Entebbe and Lake Victoria. Uh, and I don't know about you, but when I first got to Entebbe and I knew that Lake Victoria was out there, I was just like, these are the places that I read, like I knew I was gonna see the Nile. Um, and then to know that Lake Victoria, I mean, these are places I read about as a kid in history books, you know, still to this day, when I think of the Nile, I picture Moses floating down in a basket, right? Um, uh, <laughs> but, um, but while we were waiting to start our tour, when I first came to Uganda and waiting to meet Paul and go do the safari portion, um, I was flipping through a magazine and I saw that they do shoe bill stork tours in Mabamba Swamp. Now, I, I'm going to show you a picture of a shoe bill in just a few minutes, but like shoe, I saw a shoe bill on Facebook years ago. They're like six feet tall. They look prehistoric and they're just really cool looking birds. And even before I was into birding, I was like, I got to see shoe bills. So we planned a tour that day. We found a guide and there we were headed off into Lake Victoria and Mabamba Swamp to go find the shoe bill. And that's why this has been added to the safari because um, it's just such a unique experience that um, I had to have people do it. And I guess it's also kind of a, a one of the things about Uganda different than other safaris that when people ask me what's the difference between like say Tanzania and Uganda, I feel like Uganda, you're more of a participant versus uh, like a passive observer. In Uganda, we're doing stuff, we're hiking, we're we're just we're on the ground exploring. We're taking dugout canoes uh, or these wooden canoes out uh, across Lake Victoria to this swamp. So um, it starts off in um, in in Entebbe. Uh, we 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 board a boat and then the boat has a motor, um, so it takes you across Lake Victoria and then we get to a place where uh, you can't uh, the the motor has to be pulled up because it's it's all swamp lily pads, giant papyrus. Also, the first time I'd ever seen papyrus. It's amazing. So giant papyrus and our guides are looking for this shoebill swamp. So the, the Mabamba swamp is a Ramsar site, which is a world class wetland. And it's these pl places like this are necessary because they're 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 the the nesting ground for migratory birds. They're the breed, the, the nurseries for, for little fish um, and they are natural sponges. So they absorb any runoff from, from the land. So they're, they're critical um, to integrity of the bigger, uh, the land ecosystem and also the water ecosystem. So you can see here the motor taking us out across uh, the water and uh, then uh, we look, it kind of looks like the pilgrims, right? Landing on uh, Plymouth Rock, but they're looking for the shoebill uh, stork. And this is the shoebill. Isn't it a fantastic looking bird? They eat frogs and, uh, and small birds. Um, and, um, uh, and yeah, I just, this is what, this is our target species uh, when we go, we go out to Babamba Swamp. But along the way though, there's other creatures too. There's otters that you might see. Um, there are, um, uh, kingfishers and jacanas um, and whistling ducks um, and, and egrets. So after we leave uh, our exciting experience to go see the shoebill, uh, we will then head to the Ziwa Rhino Sanctuary. Now the Ziwa Rhino Sanctuary, like I said, is halfway between Entebbe and Maction Falls. And um, it's probably the best layover spot you've ever had in your life because here is the only place in Uganda that you can walk on the ground with wild rhinos. These are the white rain, it's a white rhino sanctuary. They have a breeding program here to try to reintroduce white rhinos back into the wild. And uh, there are no, uh, there are no more, there are no wild rhinos left in Uganda. The, um, once they reach, I think a breeding population of over 30, they're going to start to put them into Maction Falls, the nearby um, park. And uh, so just, you're going to find a common theme. We go to these natural areas and anytime we have like encounters with big animals, we have an orientation from a park ranger uh, who will tell us the safety uh, stuff, what to expect. And then along the way, they're also going to introduce uh, the animals to us as well. And so this is not a difficult hike. I, I think that uh, I, I've, I haven't 
tracked this. I, I don't know the exact mileage, but probably two and a half, three miles round trip uh, walking around. But you see the vegetation here is high. Um, there's bushes that will go through. And, and notice people, oh, everyone's in their forest friendly colors. Notice that. And then also people have their, their socks, um, their pants tucked into their socks and they're wearing hiking boots. Um, there are safari ants that uh, are something we need to watch out for. And safari ants will climb up your leg and start biting your butt. So uh, you want to make sure that they can't get into your pants by um, you know, putting your socks over your pants. And then hiking boots are really important because it could be a dry day, it could be a muddy day. And also hiking boots really give you your foot stability and protect your foot against like thorns and critters. So um, it's, I, I always tell people when they, they look over my packing list and they say, do I really need insert whatever that is? I always say, you have survived your whole life without me. Um, so you make your best decisions based on what feels right to you. But my recommendations are tried and true what have worked for me and what I know to keep you safe or minimize risk on this trip. So um, certainly you can always ask why there's something there because I, I guess, we, you know, we just would like clarification, but do know I don't have things in my packing list just to make you buy extra stuff or to look a certain way. As a matter of fact, I don't want anybody to go out and buy expensive gear to look good. I want you to get stuff, whether it be from friends giving it, lending it to you or wherever you get it, um, that's functional, that you feel comfortable in and that will keep you safe when necessary. So we're walking um, uh, through the sanctuary uh, looking for rhinos. And along the way, your guide will point out um, uh, like uh, dung middens where, um, there are like cause certain rhinos will have, they have their own toilet and they, 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 they drop their, their dung in certain spots as a way to mark their territory. They'll show where they're scratching the ground also to mark their territory. And then obviously we want to be able to see, uh, these, these gorillas too. I'm sorry, the gorillas. We want to see the, the rhinos. Um, and, uh, they also give you a safety talk. Like, you know, if a rhino were to charge you, what do you do? Um, and it's, you find a tree, you don't run, uh, from a rhino, uh, and, uh, but your guide is there the whole time, uh, talking to you about the adaptations, like, uh, like just how a white rhino is different from a black rhino. Um, what, where did these individuals come from? How many have had babies? Uh, yeah. And then any other animals we might see, sometimes we see different antelope, uh, on, on the, uh, that are, you know, also in the sanctuary. But uh, what I'd like to show you here is just how, how close we are to, to rhinos. Um, so that's the Zewa Rhino Sanctuary. And last year it was closed. So the group wasn't able to go there. Uh, there was a an issue with the landowner uh, who also is a cattle grazer because uh, there was an agreement that the rhino sanctuary could be there, but the cattle also needed to be there. But now the sanctuary has moved. Uh, it's still in the same area. It's moved and it's open for people to uh, come and see them. Okay, so the next one is Maction Falls. And uh, like I said before, um, uh, it's, it looks like Murchison, but it's Maction Falls. It's named after a geologist who actually thought Africa was a pretty boring continent. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so anyway, um, but it's, it is one of my favorite game parks uh, in, in the world. Um, so Maction Falls, um, it's about 1,500 square miles of wilderness. And if you can see this photo, uh, this, this infographic here that I borrowed from uh, Africa Geographic, it just shows that um, like the expanse of land that it covers. We explore the northern portion of Maction Falls um, and uh, we will see every, we'll, we'll go on a boat tour um, on the Nile River. We'll go to the falls themselves. We'll see the delta here along the um, along uh, Lake uh, Albert and the Delta along the Niles. Um, so this has so much to offer. You can see four of the five big five, Africa's big five. Does any, you don't have to, this is, I'm just posing it out there. You can think in your head, what are Africa's big five, right? It's elephants, Cape Buffalo, 
um, leopards and lions. And the fifth is the rhino. So you you saw rhinos at the Zero Wildlife Sanctuary, but like I said earlier, there's there's no uh, wild rhinos to see in in the parks at this point. But it's got all this amazing diverse habitat from a savanna woodland. You got the Barassas palms. You have tropical forests and grasslands and wetlands, and you see a majority of that. And what I just, I, I, it's indescribable what Maction Falls feels like, what this national park feels like. And like, this is Allison sitting on the back of, you know, our land cruiser, and there's a bunch of cob, um, a Ugandan cob, it's a type of antelope, all kind of scattered out there on the savanna. And uh, there's the trees out there are acacia trees. So like I said before, this, this habitat, it's, the, the quintessential um, African um, horizon, which is the grassland savanna with the acacia trees. But what makes it special here is this tropical component with these palm trees also. And uh, we usually go out in the morning and it's nice and cool and it's just open like expanse for miles. And, uh, um, and even though it's one of Africa's most visited parks, you wouldn't know it you know, because there's hardly any any like traffic, uh, even before there was a pandemic. And um, I, I'd have to say that my two favorite animals uh, uh, on in Maction Falls would be the elephants. These are African elephants, savanna elephants, and um, there's huge herds of them that we see. We have you have there's guaranteed to see them. Um, and I posted a video in my Africa uh, interest group on Facebook, which I could send you a link to that. Um, but it was a, a, a juvenile male elephant who shook one of those Barassas palms and the fruits fell down. We got to watch him, you know, uh, you know, pick up these fruits. The thing is, though, is like elephants, um, they get themselves into trouble. And um, some some of them have shortened trunks because they've gotten their trunks caught in snares. And, um, and that, that elephant that I saw shake the Barassa's palm and get the fruits, he couldn't reach the ground because his trunk was short. And it was, it was a, a very humbling experience for all of us to watch this and to think about the, the plight of these animals um, and also the importance of supporting parks because without our support, that's why poachers can come in. That's why, you know, um, these animals get caught in traps. Um, so I, I think there's, you see the beautiful side of it, but you also see the reality. And that's when you start making conscious decisions as a consumer uh, and also as an advocate to share stories uh, to people. And then also, um, I never get tired of seeing giraffes. These are Rothschild giraffes. Uh, the other, uh, many people might be familiar with the Maasai giraffe that you'd find in the Serengeti, but these are Rothschild, and uh, they're they're all over uh, in this savanna, uh, and they love to eat acacia trees. And Uganda is home to about 29 species of antelope. Um, and some of the species that you're gonna find there, the, um, this uh, top left here is, this is the heart beast. Um, on the right is the impala. Uh, down here, I'm sorry, top right is the cob. Um, and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's impala. Uh, and then uh, down here is the African cob, the left. And to the right is the, uh, is the bush buck. I'm sorry, water buck. It's a water buck. There's actually two types of bucks. Uh, there's the water buck and the bush buck there, but this is the water buck. And uh, it's one of the only places to see the potus monkey, this, this little uh, terrestrial uh, monkey here. And then we, we see leopards. We also see lions, uh, warthogs. This is uh, down at the bottom right is a monitor lizard. And so those are game drives. And then we take a boat ride up the, the Nile uh, to the base of Maction Falls, which is about 135 feet drop. And it's all coming through about a 25 foot or 24 foot gap at the top. The Nile is pushing through 24 feet. It was once thought to be the source of the Nile, but we now know that is not the truth. Uh, that's not the case. Um, but it's, a, it, it's beautiful to see the falls. We'll see them from the top and the bottom. Um, and uh, sometimes we're able to 
to do a hike. Last year, we weren't able to do the hike up here. Uh, so maybe uh, in 2022, uh, that, that trail will be open and we can, we can do the hike. Regardless, there's a road up at the top and we can see the falls looking down. So we board a boat and uh, take that on the Nile, and we have a guide who points out all the you know, birds and uh, other wildlife. Um, and uh, this is a, a, a Nile crocodile behind Libby here. I don't know if you could, if, uh, you could see it kind of blended in. That thing was probably 25 feet long. <laughs> it was amazing. Uh, we see elephants uh, that come down there to drink and feed. Um, and also just the, the deltas along the Nile are just home to so many species of birds, um, including marabou, storks, and, and ibis. And, um, you know, hippos, um, eagles, uh, and kingfishers. And, and here is the, the source, or, or this is the, the base of the falls. And that's pretty much as close as we can get because this water is really, really turbid and rough. And, rough. and then of course you can enjoy a Nile on the Nile. So after we leave Maction National Park, uh, we go to the Kibali National Park. And the Kibali National Park is where we see the chimpanzees. So, so many people come to Uganda for the gorillas, uh, but there's two things that I think that just don't get as much attention. Obviously, the game drives. Maction Park will, it will just change your life. It's just absolutely full of life and, and breathtaking and, and a spiritual place. Chimpanzees, um, they are, I think, more charismatic than mountain gorillas are. So, let's talk about the chimpanzees. So uh, Kibali National Park, it's, it's a rainforest. And it, as this says, it's the primate capital of the world. Um, there's about 20 different species of, uh, of primates in Uganda and 13 of them can be found here. And, um, uh, and in addition to that, you might also find um, forest elephants. I've never seen a forest elephant when I'm hiking. I'm not sure that I, I want to, but when I'm hiking, I'm actually, thinking about forest elephants because they're a little bit more aggressive than savanna elephants are, but we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, bush bucks um, uh, and lots of bird species. So we stay at a place called Chimpanzee View Lodge and we stay in these, like, look at this. Does it look like the Wizard of Oz? I don't know, all these rolling green hills. It's just fairy tale like And uh, so now we're at higher elevation. Before we were in the dry savanna uh, and now we're in, we're tropical rainforest and surrounding the tropical rainforest in Kibali uh, National Park is uh, our tea fields and agriculture. So it's also a good way to see how habitat loss is happening due to agricultural practices. But uh, we stay here at um, this, uh, this beautiful lodge overlooking the valley. And uh, I have a video of one of, this is what it looks like inside of one of those little, little houses. Um, and this one was in my, this is, this is mine. So each one has two beds and you have mosquito netting, but it's colder up here too. So you don't need air conditioning and, um, in the, the bathroom is clean and, and simple. Uh, there is, uh, that's a shower over there. It's, I'm sorry, that's kind of dark, but there's no creepy crawlies and look at the view from your porch and all of the little, um, cabanas or all these little, uh, I want to call it casitas from all my trips in Mexico, but these little houses have, uh, have these beautiful views. So we drive up into the forest and you start to get greeted by the olive baboons. And once we get to the park rangers headquarters, you get an orientation. And then you're led on a trail to go find the chimpanzees. Um, now, the guide here, this, um, the ranger, you see she has a gun. And that gun is to scare away primarily uh, the, the forest elephants. So if we were to encounter a forest elephant on the trail, uh, she would shoot that in the air to, to haze the elephant to, to make it go away. Um, and uh, so it's not there to, like, protect people from other people. It's just to uh, you know, protect people from animals in the forest, mainly in, as a form of a, a scare tactic. And uh, the hiking is, it could be, you know, it starts off on, on some of these platforms like this. 
Um, and you, it could be flat like this one, but it could also be rolling hills. It could be steep. We could go off trail because these chimpanzees are not like behind you know a fence. They are. It's the jump. It's the rainforest. So they're moving around, and so the rangers could be looking for signs that the chimpanzees were there nearby. So they might look for the knuckle prints. She might look uh, look for scat food droppings, but the key indicator is going to be the calls. Chimpanzees have over 30 calls and uh, there are vocalizations that they use to, um, you know, talk to one another. Now, I've done the this experience three times. And the first time I saw the chimpanzees, it had rained and chimpanzees don't like to come to the ground. So they're up in the trees. I did have really good views of them with my binoculars. I got to see behaviors through my, my, my binoculars. And I had a, a camera that had the 300 lens. Uh, so I got some decent photos. But um, if I would have just used my phone, you would have gotten pictures like this. Um, but again, wild animals, and they don't like it when the ground is wet. But this is how they most likely start off regardless of any type of weather, because we get there at a time when the chimpanzees are just waking up. So they're lounging, they're lounging in the trees like this. And then you might just start to hear them like yip and, and whoop and, and start to talk back and forth between the branches. And then eventually they come to the ground and experiences like this are not uncommon. So you can see we're, we're not, we're just standing very still, taking pictures. We're not making any loud noises. So this is from last year. So people were wearing masks and it's possible that we still would need to wear masks in 2022 because I mean, these are primates and we don't want to give them our respiratory illnesses. And honestly, I kind of think it's a good idea regardless moving forward. Uh, it's not my, I don't make the management plan, but I think it's a good idea. So these three males are, uh, actually there's two males here right now. So they are um, the, the, like, they're like the, uh, what do you call it? The, the prime minister, the, the vice president, and the president. They're the three main guys who are like in, uh, the leaders of their troop. And uh, they're you know, just grooming each other and letting us observe them uh, be chimpanzees. Now, these are 97% human. So chimpanzees are our closest cousins. They're 97, we share 97% of our DNA with chimpanzees. And uh, here's another video too that I just wanted to show. I mean, look how human this is. Oh, I'll be quiet because they're gonna vocalize. We've all been there. So the ranger, we spend a lot of time just being quiet and making observations. And then the ranger will tell us about individuals of that troop. They know all of their stories from when they were babies uh, and who they are like, who's it's like a it's like a soap opera who's sleeping with who who doesn't like the other um and uh it's just really wonderful to get to know the individuals of that troop and and to see them more than just as more than just you know animals that we're observing but they're individuals with uh, with personalities <laughs> and so uh here's some more chimpanzee personality right uh this guy was just kind of hanging out with his feet up against the log here notice look at these big feet and the way their their toe and their their two toes um you know clamped can clamp together for climbing up and down trees these guys move so fast they move so fast i don't have a video of them moving that fast sometimes they run through the forest and they pound on the fig tree buttresses and scream uh, <laughs> like, uh and then you got this guy on the left who has no shame After you do the chimpanzee trek, you get a certificate uh, as uh, your souvenir, and um, and yeah, it's like it's just as special uh, as the gorilla trekking. I think this is what I consider morning rituals. Every morning, Paul will take people uh, who want to get up and walk around the property birding. Uh, so this is. Uh, 
the morning at one of the mornings at Chimpanzee View Lodge. He has a spotting scope. So if you if you if you have binoculars that don't have a lot of power, he's got a spotting scope and he'll put it on the bird and he'll and he'll tell you about it. Um, and if a bird stays still long enough, you can actually put your camera phone on top and get a photo of it. And then we, as we drive from uh, Kibali down to Queen Elizabeth National Park, we go through what's called the, um, the it's, it's like the Switzerland of Uganda. Um, it just really, because we're climbing up to 7,000 feet, you see these crater lakes and, uh, you know, these rolling green hills and forests. Okay, Queen Elizabeth National Park is between Kibali National Forests and Bowindi and Pentwell Forest. So we go up uh, and then we go down and we go into what's called a, another type of savanna. It's a, 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 a wooded savanna. And so uh, uh, just showing here where we were. So um, this is Maction Falls D. E is where we just saw the chimpanzees. F is Queen Elizabeth National Park. It's the Ishasha sector. So uh, Queen Elizabeth National Park is divided into north and south. We go to the southern Is Ishasha sector, sector. And the goal for Queen Elizabeth National Park is to find tree climbing lions. They remind me of Christmas ornaments dangling from trees. And uh, this isn't a new species of of, of lion. It's just a, a behavior that not all lions do. And they tend to do it to get off of the ground to, uh, to get away from ants, or if it's hot, uh, they like to, to hang out in these trees. And so we, it's another game drive. It's all, you know, it's a transfer slash game drive. And um, as you can see, it's Savannah, but there's no palm trees here, like you saw in Maction Falls. And uh, we do see Topi here. It's another type of antelope and elephants and cape buffalo these are called retired generals they're cape buffalo all males that don't have a herd anymore so they're just kind of keeping each other company and uh and then we find a tree we just have to find the right acacia tree you look for trees that have uh these tree these lions hanging around in them and you go at just the right time in the day and um, park your vehicle and observe the tree climbing lions. Now there's really not much to observe other than just to take it all in. And you can like with your binoculars too, you can just see how big their paws are, or you might see them yawn. And look at those tootsies hanging out through this acacia tree. Um, they're just so beautiful. And here's a, a short video of uh, just to kind of, I'll be quiet so you can hear the background. And the video zoom out and that's taken with my phone so you can see how good of a zoom that is um but also that you know we're not like right on top of them but uh we we get a good view so we'll spend the night um in uh at a wilderness camp um in isasha national uh, near queen elizabeth um and it's called the isasha wilderness camp you can click on the link in in my trip uh, itinerary and see about see that it's actually the closest we'll stay the closest that we um type of accommodation that's kind of like a a safari tent camp but it's on raised platforms and there's a, it's like a hotel on a platform a hotel room on a platform but at night you might hear hippos or other animals walking around outside Okay, we're going to go now to the Bowindi Impenetrable Forest, and this is the main event, right? This is why most people are going to come to Uganda, to have this experience with the, the gorillas. And that is down here at, um, at G. We stay at the Bakiga, um, it's at the Bakiga Eco Lodge, and I'll show you that picture in a second. But here just here are just some photos I took with my phone of uh, gorillas um, playing that, I, that we saw last year. And uh, it, you can't help but look into the eyes of any of these animals and not feel kinship and also a sense of empathy and think they deserve a home and spa you know, space and to be able to thrive just as much as humans do. And, and their, um, you know, their, their habitat is under is under threat. Uh, for uh, oil exploration and um, and agriculture, 
And that's why it's so important that people come and, uh, um, you know, pay to see them because the gorilla viewing permit is $800. So of that $5,500 you see on the website, $800 goes to gorilla viewing. And I think it's $400 goes to chimpanzee viewing. So it's pretty expensive. That's a good chunk of money just to pay for permits. But those permits are going to protect their habitat and protect those animals. So the Boone Impenetrable National Forest and National Park is for gorillas, but also for the blue monkeys and the hoist monkeys. So these are other types of primates that you could see. And as we drive to the park's headquarters, as we drive to Bowindi, uh, this is another great example of the different types of you know, uh, agriculture that's happening um, on, on these hillsides. And I think it just what's not shown here though, is that if you zoomed in to somebody who was out there in those fields right now, they have literally hoes, like they have a hoe. There's no mechanical farming equipment. People are harvesting and, 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 um, and I guess, you know, planting their fields by hand. It looks like backbreaking work. But this is the view from Bakiga Lodge. And this is what you wake up to for two nights. And I never, it never gets old. It, and it, the, the mood changes all the time. There was a rainstorm that had just passed and the sun was starting to come out and the, the cloud forest, it's the, it's the gorillas in the mist. And we stay in these little um, little cabins on, on the hillside. It does get cold up here. So in the packing list, it says bring hats and warm sweaters and sweatpants um, because it's going to get cold at night. And this was actually in the morning uh, before we went out to go see the gorillas and look at the sunrise. And actually on this day, as we got up in the morning, there was a little red speck off on the horizon. And I wasn't sure what that was it was in the wrong place for it to be the sun and paul said it was the volcano going off in virunga national park in the congo I mean, it was so cool to see this red sky and then eventually the sky you know the sun rose and you couldn't see it anymore but look at this beautiful view in the back once you get to the ranger station uh, you get broken up into groups and the groups are divided based on um well so let me step back there are scouts that have already gone out in the morning looking for gorillas so they know where the different families or the different troops are and then when people show up they divide the groups of people into no more than eight participants no more than eight hikers into an easy medium and hard hike so if everybody who shows up is like totally out of shape somebody is going to be on that hard hike that maybe is out of shape um or it could get somebody who if everybody's fit and you know health like active um it's not gonna be a problem You're just gonna be broken up into whatever group so the scouts do their best to try i mean we can talk ahead of time if you have some concerns the scouts and the rangers do their best to help break groups up so that they're on the a, a, a path that is right for them but um if you do your research online about gorilla trekking, you're going to see horror stories of people who have been out in the field for eight hours, out, out in the field for eight hours trekking for gorillas. That's never happened in my case. So um, I, I, I can't say that, like, so I've done it three times. It's never been an issue. I've done all three levels of hikes from easy to strenuous to medium. Um, and uh, they're all very doable. You're just gonna, like, if, if, yeah, I, I think you're you're gonna your heart rate's gonna get up a little bit anyway. But I want you to know you're never gonna be left behind. Um, everybody has a porter with them, so that's somebody who will. Uh, so, like here in this photo, um, porters are carrying our backpacks. Those porters are gonna have a hand outstretched to you to pull you up a steep like step or slippery, or they're gonna be behind you to catch you on something slippery. You're not gonna be like cliff hanging. Um, it's, it's, it's not gonna, yeah. There's a lot of people that do this, okay? So it's not something that uh, you have to be some expert hiker to do. But I highly recommend that anybody who wants to come to Uganda, start getting your body ready for it. Um, just start walking, ride your bike, do a Stairmaster. Uh, just start two or, two or three months before you go to Uganda, because regardless of, of what trail you get, by preparing your body more, you're going to enjoy it, the experience more. 
And this is what it looks like. So this was, I, I was on the easy hike last year. We only went a quarter of a mile. <laughs> That's it. One quarter of a mile and bam, there the gorillas were. Um, before I'd hiked four miles uh, round trip. That's not even a whole, I mean, this was one, this was a half. I think I did no more than a mile last year. The most I've done in the past is four miles uh, round trip. Um, and it's been no more than two to three hours at a time uh, looking for gorillas. Uh, they do have what's called the Ugandan helicopter, which is a bunch of, of those porters will get a stretcher. If, if someone really, like, uh, for example, uh, the very first time I did it, there was a woman who was probably 90 years old who wanted to go do this trek. And they carried her on the stretcher to where the gorillas were, lowered her down. She got like helped over to see the gorillas had her one hour observation because everybody only gets one hour, no more than eight people observing habituated gorillas for one hour. She got back on her stretcher and they carried her back down. So that could be used for anybody if they're just like, you poop out and you're like, I can't do this. I want to go. I, I can't climb, but I can't walk back down, whatever. There's always a plan B or C. I've never had to use that, the Ugandan helicopter or had anybody that needs it, but I just wanted to let you know. Um, so, but it's called the Buwindi Impenetrable Forest for a reason. Look at like what we're walking through, right? It's it's lush vegetation. There's deep grasses with holes that you could twist an ankle in. So it's uh, uh, really uh, important that you go slowly, follow your porter, let your porter help you. And then just like the chimpanzees, you might get to a spot, see this, the bottom one here. It's hard to see the gorillas right now in this photo, but it gets better. So this is a silverback that we came upon who is just kind of sitting there uh, watching his family. Um, and uh, we, we observed him for a little bit. And then the scouts and the rangers won't let us do anything without feeling that the gorillas are displaying behavior that says, I'm cool with you. <laughs> um, so it's not like we're, these guys know these animals. And I said, these, like I said, these are habituated gorillas, so they're used to people observing them. And uh, but if they're irritated, they'll let you know through different vocalizations uh, and, uh, and, and and behaviors. But this is um, here's a, a video. What I loved about this is the so the the silverback is a little he's maybe 50 yards away from these two who are playing. And this is a juvenile with a, a sub adult female. And what was so special about this, and I could get a little bit close. I was letting obviously clients get closer. There's better video out there. I was um, a little bit further back. But what's special about this, I'm trying to skip ahead a bit, is that they were um, like giggling. You could hear like they had laughter. And uh, it, like, there, there's, there is joy there. And, you know, one of the things that science wants to not give animals is our feelings and emotions. And these were clearly, these two were clearly enjoying themselves and enjoying their company. <laughs> Do you see the teeth of that female? Uh, um, yeah. So it was really just special to, to be, to be witnessing that and to be able to be trusted and allowed to enter their home and, and see them interacting with each other. And this video is going to give you a really good idea of what it's like to look for, for uh, mountain gorillas. And this in the, the time um, timeline of this actual experience, we saw those babies, the, the sub-adult and that, that juvenile playing before this. Um, and so our time was about to end and it was time to start heading back. Um, but uh, this is what it's like pretty much on every trip. So the scout sees uh, that the gorilla family is moving. And so he's clearing the branches a little bit for us. And you're gonna start to see members of the family walk past. Are your guys' hearts pounding? How do you think you'd feel seeing this? Look how dense the vegetation is. We're on a footpath. Yeah. 
And I'm just gonna let this video go a little longer because I want you to see, see the whole family pass by. And the silverback is gonna be the last one. Oh, actually, I guess, oh yeah, because this is this is one of the females walking. And I have, each of my experiences with gorilla trekking has been different and not one has been disappointing by any means. Each one has its own wonderful story. Here comes the big boy. Look at how big he is. This is like anthropology 101. These are our, our ancestors, our forest people. You're not allowed to touch the gorillas, but they can touch you. They can walk past you. Sometimes they touch you. Um, we're supposed to stay uh, uh, 30 feet from them. Unless, you know, obviously we can't tell, gorillas don't uh, know measurements. And the scouts will make noises too. They'll do like grunting noises, like, mm, mm, and the ranger as well. And that's uh, uh, gorillas. It's kind of like, it's like, we're cool, man. We're cool. And the, the, it, it relaxes the, the silverback. Yeah, and here's what uh, like a, a hiking troop looks like uh, with the scouts and the rangers and, and the participants. And then just like chimpanzee viewing, you get a certificate. And one of the things that they do ask is that you please tell people about Uganda. Please tell people about this experience because the tourism is what's gonna save these mountain gorillas. And it is what's brought them back from near extinction. So after we leave Buwindi, we have a nice drive uh, towards um, Lake Mumboro. But you know, again, just like I just I like I wanted to post this because I I it's just kind of a day in the life on safari traveling between you can see the banana fields. Up on the banana leaf. That's Paul. He's pointing out birds. <laughs> Yep. Okay, so now we're going to the last place, which is Lake Mamburo National Park. And Lake Mamburo National Park is, I would, it's, it, I have different experiences every time I'm at Lake Mamburo. Sometimes it is uh, uh, like, well, the, the very first time I did it, I was like, oh, it's kind of like the Nile. But the, the, the second and third time I did it, it was better than the Nile. So I just like any park, right? It's kind of where you, it, it depends on the animal activity that day. And uh, I feel like Lake Mamburo is like a mini Serengeti. Uh, and it also is a place where you find all the animals, either you didn't get the best picture of on this, the other safari parks, um, or your, your opportunity to get your photo. This is one of the very few, uh, this is the only place in Uganda that you could see the Plains Zebra. And it's one of my favorite lodges. This is called Wakobo Lodge. And uh, it's got, it's, it has this, this little infinity pool that overlooks the savanna. And, uh, um, and, you know, sometimes animals walk by, uh, this is a, a view from uh, the, uh, from a game drive. It's a place where we see elan, it's the heaviest antelope. And again, this is the only place you can see the elans in, in Uganda. Uh, it's the home to the dwarf mongoose. And uh, it's home to impalas as well, the fastest antelopes. And you do see these animals, these birds, uh, these are the gray crowned cranes. This is Uganda's national bird. We take a boat trip out onto the lake and um, I would have to say it's the best hippo viewing I've ever seen and will have like in any place I ever go to. There, uh, a group of hippos is called a school. And so we get up close to them and you hear them grunting and snorting and blowing bubbles. And uh, I, like, it's, 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 I don't know, you can't help but love hippos. It's hard to believe that they kill more people in Uganda than, or in Africa than, you know, the big cats or elephants. 
And you, uh, another great opportunity to take pictures of Nile uh, crocodile. And here's actually more photos that, uh, of uh, Wakobo Lodge overlooking the valley. This is the last place we stay on safari. And again, these little houses, uh, these break up into two beds and you can hear baboons and other animals walking around outside. So we spent our last night in uh, Lake Mamburo and then the next day flights depart from Entebbe. So you could come in early or stay later if you needed to in Entebbe. Uh, and we stay at the Papyrus house. It's $130 a night per room. You could, you could share it with somebody else. Um, but uh, your flights shouldn't be booked um, it, it, on the travel parameters. It'll have you book your flights after 5 p.m. Uh, just so it, it, we make sure we can get to Kampala. I'm sorry, Entebbe on time. And um, yeah, so that pretty much sums up uh, what it's like to go to Uganda. It's really, it's only a crazy dream until you do it. And next week uh, on Saturday, I'm sorry, on Saturday, November 6th at 10 a.m., um, we're gonna uh, have it, uh, Paul uh, join the, the Zoom presentation. And I did see uh, that uh, um, Debbie said that she won't be able to make it. And I am gonna record this session just like I, I'm doing now. And I'll share a link to you. Uh, I'll share a link uh, to anybody who can't make it um, next week. And if you have any questions, you can always email me. I'm Tara at greenadventures.com. It's Tara and then Green Adventures. Notice the spelling is E-D, like education. So uh, you can reach out to me. And that's that's it. Huh. So now if you'd like to turn on your cameras, you're welcome to ask some questions if you'd like. Does anybody have any questions? And uh, I did say that I was going to show uh, a code if you to um, uh, to get five hundred dollars off uh, the the price the advertised price right now. Um, it, it the code is November fifteen November fifteen. Oh no, N O V one five. So you'll have to unmute yourselves and let me take a drink of water. <laughs> and feel free to jump in. Uh, Lori Anderson has actually been on this trip. So she can she can answer questions like a participant from a participant's point of view. And um, I guess uh, you can raise your hand if you have a question. We'll go that way so we're not talking over each other. I'm going to unmute you, Lori, if you want to jump in. Can uh, uh, can you hear me? Well, I know you can hear me. I can't hear you, Lori. Maybe uh, my, let me see here. I had some issues with my earbuds. Let me, let me see something here. I'm gonna try something else. Uh, is Amy make, is Amy calling me? <laughs> no, that was not sorry. <laughs> Oh, good. So I do have, I, okay, I'm glad you said something because I was beginning to think that maybe I, I couldn't hear. I just got a, a new computer and I'm having issues like technologically. I'm okay now. Though. Hi, 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 Amy. Ah, you did a good job. <laughs> There's a lot of questions. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think if there's anybody else. Uh, oh, like the link to the recording. Sure. Barb, I can send that to you. Everybody who's on this list that registered, I'd be happy to just send the link out uh, for next week. But anybody have questions? Everyone's good? I try to cover a lot. Um, all right, well then, you know, thanks so much for, for uh, coming on the trip. And, um, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm manifesting. Thanks so much for coming to Uganda. <laughs> uh, and, um, and yeah, let me, you know how to reach Sarah, me. I have a, qu I have a okay. question. Go ahead. This is Patty. Um, when can we sign up? Can we sign up now? Can we? Yes. Yeah. Please sign up work? now. Yeah. So, um, uh, what deposit do you need and that sort of thing? It's all. You know, I don't. I don't have this information right. Actually, let me pull up the website. I'll tell you what it says. Um, so, so we have two trips right now. So we have uh, a women's trip that's April twenty seventh to May eighth. And a co-ed trip that's April 14 to 25. Uh, we have critical mass for the co-ed trip. Um, we don't have critical mass yet for the women's trip, but that doesn't mean we're, we're not going to get there. So um, 
people always ask if I sign up and you don't have enough people, will I get my money back? Of course, we give you all your money back. But if you wait, there's an early bird registration. And um, so if the longer you wait, the more expensive the trip gets. But that's to reward people who sign up early because without anybody signing up, the trip never happens. If everyone just kind of waited like, oh, well, maybe. Um, so we need, we need to reach critical mass by uh, January. So let's see here. And there's currently, um, there's currently two people signed up for the women's trip. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to the Green Adventures, um, the booking page. And uh, if you, the deposit is $9.95 and then there's installments. So your final installment will be due March 28th. So when you click to book, um, it's gonna list out all of the payment. It's gonna show you what the, the installments are and what payment is being taken right now. Um, and, um, and then it, it automatic, I use WeTravel as my third uh, party booking platform so that you'll get emails from them reminding you to make a payment if you don't sign up for automatic payments. Um, yeah. And so the, the price right now is 55.25. After November 15th, it goes up to 57.25. So um, if you if you sign up now with your five hundred dollar discount, airline do you trust? what's up? Oh, what airline? No, that's okay, Tara. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, so with um, so with the I'm looking at um, the. I don't think I'm sharing a screen right now, but you all see me, right? I'm, I'm front and center. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm just looking at the, the booking page here. So um, the right now, the cost is 55 no, dollars And so if you, I, I'm, not, I'm not sharing the screen. I'll just here. I'll just do that. Um, uh, here, so you can see. So I'm sharing the screen now. So uh, this is the, the booking page. The way to get here is uh, you go to Destinations International Uganda. Click on Uganda. And then you come to a landing page and there are two trips here. You click on the women's trip if that's the one you want. And um, it has a trip description, some videos, highlights, inclusions, exclusions, then the payment terms. And then there's a spot here that says book this trip now. Oh, and I just realized it's got the wrong one there. I've got to fix that. Um, that's really interesting. I don't even know how that even happened. So I'm going to fix that. Um, but uh, if you sign up um, before November 15th, um, you will get the early bird price. So that's the $500 off. It brings it down to about uh, $5,000. Um, and, uh, so there's incentive to do that. You certainly can go after you can sign up after November 15th, but then the price is 57, 25 and you get, it's now $5,200. Um, the sooner you sign up, the sooner we can, you know, move forward. Everybody can move forward with things. So I need to make a note. Um, so yeah. Quick question. Are you doing, do you do a trip every year around April? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And mm -hmm. when will you be posting 2023? Uh, as soon as I'm done posting 2022. <laughs> okay, um, I, I really, I'm, my goal, I'm really making it a goal that I have the trips up 12 months before. So by April, in theory, uh, I should have it. I'm, I'm just behind this year because last year with when we were just waiting to know if everything was a go, right? So all my, all my protocols I've had for 13 years, like, it being so in, like confirmed in advance, it was like everything kind of ran into each other. So I'm playing catch up now. So, but the, the short story is that uh, by April, um, I should have 2023s on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How much is insurance? Insurance, it's about 10% of the package price. So if you're gonna like, so you think about if, if, if the, the good insurance, and I know it's an investment, but if you're going to, uh, if you just get uh, a regular comprehensive insurance from like Travel Guard or Travel X, your whole package, you know, $5,000 plus, let's say $1,000 for flights is 6,000. 10% of that is going to be 600 bucks is going to be your insurance. 
Now there's other insurance out there. If you, if you book insurance within uh, 15 days of your initial deposit, you can upgrade to cancel for any reason. So if you, it's like any reason, right? Like you decide, I just don't want to do this. I, something came up in my family, like whatever, you don't even like, you could just cancel for any reason, but there are different levels. There's like 75%. You get a full refund of the non-refundable prepaid trip costs or 50% of the non-refundable prepaid trip costs. It, there's, they cost different for the more, more that you insure. Um, and, you know, just, and I just want to talk to what COVID, I mean, what travel insurance covers, because some people have been saying, well, one of the questions is, is uh, COVID is a known, um, a known, uh, you know, thing. And so travel insurance is not going to cover that. That's not true. So what is true is travel insurance is not going to cover you for fear of travel. If you decide, I just don't want to go because there's a level four travel advisory, which if we feel it's safe to go, we're going. Last year we did Tanzania at level four um, and we went to Costa Rica at level four and Costa Rica is level four right now. So most places are level four. We can dabble in that in a second. But if you just like I, a fear of travel isn't covered or if um, uh, let's see, what's another one? If, a bo if the borders close and like we can't go, but it, we would default back to what we were, do, what we did last year. So I ran into this scenario with, without even knowing what to do last year. I, we had to take it one step at a time last year. And this is what will default to this year. If a, if a border is closed or there's no airlines going to uh, a, a destination or the destination, you can't travel around. We can't do any of the activities. The trip is postponed. And if it's postponed, um, travel insurance will let you push your date ahead. So you don't lose your travel insurance. You get to use it next year. We just change the dates. And then also, as long as you postpone, uh, the price won't go up. We just freeze where you're at and it gets pushed to the next year or the next available time for travel. If you cancel, we just look at where we're at in that point. That's why I like to do installments. It's really kind of where the money I need in order to reserve things for you at that location, right? So I can't get permits back from Gorilla Trekking. So what what I would say, like, so let's just say, like, we'll do what we did last year. So last year, people, or two years ago, people who canceled, it was a $1,500 cancellation fee if you um, if you just want to pull out completely. So you got a 100% refund minus your $1,500. Um, uh, or you could just stay where you're at and lose nothing. We'll move everything to a future date, but the world's looking better. I don't, I, that was kind of a scenario I worried about in 2021. I'm feeling better about 2022. <laughs> so we have to book our own, uh, air, our own flights. Yes. You and Tebby. Yes. Now that might be a problem. I see United Airlines is always canceling flights. What, you know, what was something like that happens? Well, that's where it's good to work with. Okay. There's two things here. Uh, as I recommend, like in, um, when I was giving kind of how to get to Entebbe, I said, work with a travel agent. That solves your problem because she will rebook you. So let's just say, um, it, like we didn't have this issue with last year. Nobody couldn't get there because their flights were canceled, just so you know. Um, and it's becoming less and less of a thing. Um, but so if, if that scenario came up, the travel agent then would rebook you on another airline and get a refund for you from that airline. So she would make the call. She'd do all the reworking and get your money back. Okay. So could I go through like Expedia? Would that I don't recommend. I, that like, I, I see big red, like, eh, eh, don't do that because people who went through someone like, like a, a websites like Expedia, they, they, they got nowhere. They got very little help um, and they didn't get refunds it, or they did get refunds. It took a long time. Gail doesn't charge any more than what you'd find on Expedia. Gail could even use miles. If you wanted to use miles, she just charges a $25 booking fee. I'm telling you for all the refunds that woman got for us in 2020, that 25 bucks should have been a hundred. That were the hours that she spent making sure that everyone was taken care of. So for 25 bucks, it's, it's, it's an extra level of peace of mind. So who should I go through? So when I send you the travel parameters, um, I include Gail's information okay, and okay. you email Gail and say, I'm going with green to green with green adventures to Uganda. Here are the travel parameters. What's available for me. And she'll send you the okay. options. Yeah. All it's right. so much easier. Yeah. Okay. Where are you at? Where are you from? 
Rochester, New York. Oh, you're lucky. You've got good flight. You've got good airports over that, that way. No, I'm not near New York City, though. No, but Rochester could give you a, a like a connection to like JFK that would give you a direct yeah. flight to like Brussels or something. So, yeah. I mean, in that sense. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good question. What about tips and gratuities and all that stuff? So um, it, I, I tell people how much money to bring. Uh, it's about 350 bucks per 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 participant. I collect it all. I distribute it on your behalf and you don't have to worry about it. Exactly. Um, people are welcome though, to bring more money to give for someone who's gone above and beyond. And also Paul, just another thing too, Paul has a nonprofit called Birds of a Feather. And it's a, an organization that he helps the community where he grew up. He, he puts kids through school and does environmental education programs with them too. So you could bring luggage with uh, like, uh, like school supplies or kids clothes. Um, and those are gladly accepted um, and, or cash. Those things are accepted too. And he's so good. He's just so good. It goes, it goes directly to the people who need it. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you get like, uh, what if you, you share a room with somebody? Mm -hmm. What if you snore? Yeah. So when you sign up, I ask people to write, their preferences, like sleep preferences. Like I'm a light sleeper. I snore. I like, and then I match people up based on, I can sleep through anything. I snore. <laughs> like, Oh, you seem, you guys are good matches. Um, and you know, we have a group of nine. And so like, it's a small, it's small. So the options for like, you know, having roommates are slim. I have to tell you in the 13 years I've been doing this, I've never had to move anybody because they, they snore and their, their roommate, it didn't work out, but we'll, we'll solve problems when they come up if we need to. And that's why there's also one of us too. It's like a trip leader could be moved to another room and we'll, we can, we'll work it out. Okay. Mm -hmm. hmm. um, but I want to bring, uh, when you talk about that too, some people travel with CPAP machines and uh, Uganda's uh, infrastructure is, I mean, they have they have power at all these places we're going to, but it's third world and there could be power outages. And if you need a CPAP machine, uh, you should bring one with a battery as a backup just in case. Okay. Yeah. All right. The same thing with like, um, uh, you know, those uh, uh, power banks, you should have like, you should have extra power banks because yeah, power could go out. I wouldn't come here relying on doing any work. Some people like to do to well, not like, but need to do work while they're traveling. This is not the trip for that. We're in a car a lot. It, if you could do things from your phone, sure, like in between transfers, but I wouldn't uh, come here, um, come to Uganda, planning on connecting to the internet and sitting down and, and using your laptop because the Wi-Fi can be really, really slow. Okay. Where do we get forest friendly color clothing? REI is my best friend right now. Okay. okay. <laughs> I love REI. Uh, there's also um, uh, what's what's Sierra Sierra Trading Post is a good one. Right. Okay. Columbia. You can even get it from Walmart. Um, I just I just say don't buy clothing that uh, like it's like like tropical pinks and you know blues. Uh, you want forest friendly. It's a temperature in April. It varies. So it's on the equator. Okay. So the temperature is consistent but it varies for the, the region we're at in the, on the trip. So everything down by, let's say by Lake Victoria in Entebbe or even Maction Falls. Um, and I, I, everybody, this, I hear this is a thing on Zoom is everyone shows, has their, has their, uh, their animals. I wish my dog was up here. Um, so, uh, but anyway, uh, so those places, the savannas can be hot and dry um, and humid. But uh, when you're up in like the forest, it's cool and rainy. Okay. So layering is gonna be, a, when you plan your clothing, uh, I'll tell you how I travel. I have like a moisture wicking tank top. I bring a, a like an athletic type t-shirt or, um, and I have long sleeve shirts like this. Um, and I usually, I treat my long sleeve sh shirts with the permethrin, which is like, not everybody likes to use it, but it does keep the bugs from biting you. And there's, I always say there's never really a problem with bugs in Uganda, but maybe it's because I have all this bug spray on. <laughs> so, like, I don't know, I don't see that. There's no bugs. Um, 
So, but if you're not, if you're not going to do permethrin, then you should definitely have long, just make sure you have long, loose clothing. Okay. I have a very detailed packing list. Okay. Mm -hmm. These are great questions. If we have more, we just call you, right? Yes. Yeah. You can email or call. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Sounds good. And Rosemary, how did you find out about the trip? I have been looking for trips like forever. I've, uh, you know, I'm a solo person and uh, I've just been searching the internet. And Were you looking for Uganda Florida. or just in general? Um, well, um, I'm going to Costa Rica in January, but that's through AAA. Okay. And, uh, but uh, for this, no one wants to go with me. So, mm -hmm. and I always wanted to go on a gorilla track and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So this seemed to work out because it's uh, other like-minded travelers mm -hmm. and I, I would feel a lot safer, I think. Yeah. Just, yeah. So, yeah. Well, good. Well, I, ho I hope you'll join us. Oh, yeah. I'm going to sign up. You're going to have a great time. Oh, yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait. Yeah. I can't wait. I also want to go to Iceland. <laughs> it's oh, Iceland. I know. There's so many, like every trip, every trip that's on my website, like people always ask, like, what's your favorite trip? It's like, it's kind of like, love the one you're with. I mean, I love, I love them all. I can't say I love one more than the other, but right now I have this, like one of my, that I feel the most excited about are the Africa trips and mm -hmm. Iceland. I really, I really love them. I, 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 Africa, Uganda in particular, I really love Uganda. And uh, because I just, I will, it just feels wild to me and it's, it's more active. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to spending a month there. And then Iceland, the same, I really like hiking. So we have two types of trips in Iceland. We have this, a through hike and a multi-sport right. hike. Okay. Tara, could I ask a question? Sure, sure. Uh, thank you so much for your enthusiasm. It's very exciting. I think it really is very exciting. But um, what what do you would you say are is the percentage of chance that this trip will actually happen? And you know, every year, every year it's a, it's I say this, I, I wonder, but I would say 80, 90% sure that it's gonna happen. I'm already there. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> So I'm yeah, I'm ninety percent sure that this is going to happen. I haven't had to cancel a trip yet, um, and uh, this is typically the time of year people start to sign up. It's you know it's coming. It's like it's one of those big trips that usually Africa trips start to get bookings right in like the the the, the, ho the winter holidays right before. Okay, Thank you're you. signed up. Let, tell everyone Barb's so in. <laughs> I've been waiting for two years, so I'm yes. excited. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I look forward to seeing you in Uganda. It's going to happen. And please keep sharing with your friends, sharing with your networks. Um, you got to get, just gonna keep getting the word out there. But every year it happens. So I, 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 it's just, this is the cycle of my life. <laughs> Go on trips, find more people. Do you ever advertise on Facebook on like women's traveling groups? I tried to put the link a couple of times and one time it was taken off, but the other time they let it go through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't because I have a vested interest, but I've had, I've seen other people, other people have shared links within there because it says, do you have people like, I want to go do this. Who do you recommend? And people put links in. Yeah. Okay. Great idea. Yeah. Tara, may I yeah. ask a question? Sure. Sorry. Sorry, I had to drop off, so I may have missed if someone asked this question. Sure. Uh, and thanks for, thanks for your presentation, by the way. Oh, uh, great. In the, early, early on, you mentioned that uh, the maximum group is nine, and once all were confirmed, then you would, uh, once everyone's confirmed, you get back to them. But what happens in a situation where those nine are confirmed and say one one drops out for whatever reason, or what happens to the rest of us? If that sure. Other trip. Yeah, and, and that's that's my problem, not yours. Um, it's it like just I mean, just to make it simple. Um, and and all payments are non refundable. Um, so people's installments have like based on the timeline of their installments protect the group integrity, right? So if someone dropped out midway, I have enough to cover the, like it covers overhead. So I I've planned accordingly. Um, and, um, gotcha. so, the, yeah. so, the, so the nine, the nine committed, if three fall out, the six of us are still going no matter what. That's correct. 
Okay, cool. Yeah, That's, yeah. I've never had. My, that was my yeah. Go ahead. No, that that's my only question. I, I thank you very much. Oh, you're so, and I, and I also build in oh. a buffer too. So it's not like it's, I don't put myself into a situation where if, if I lose one, everything is, you know, everything falls apart. So there's a buffer there and other, other things in place. So that's a good question though. And actually the maximum, the maximum of this trip is, is six, is 15. Cause we have three vehicles and you like, and you can still have a small group experience, but my critical mass is nine. I, I, I want to travel with nine participants. Okay, I have a uh, that, that brings up another question. Sure. Does that, I, I, I don't remember on the, on the website, is there single supplements? There is, yes. And I, I think it's like 700 or $800. I don't know right off the top of my head, but okay. if you wanted a single throughout. But it's available. What's that? It's available. It is available, yes. So available. Last question. What is the total length of driving time during the 12 days? A lot. Uh, I don't like, so let me just think. Um, that's, that's a really good question. It's, it, it's a lot of driving and maybe Lori has some, something to put in there, but like, I would say we are in the car. Well, it, it was, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I could get back to you and I could look at the itinerary right, right off the top of my head. I mean, our longest days are probably an eight hour day of morning of, you know, a transfer, a game drive, get out for lunch, maybe do a short hike, do another game drive, have dinner back at the lodge. Um, and then our biggest transfer days are six and eight hours. Those are the two, those are two days of that. Okay, I, I would be interested in the total amount of driving time at mm -hmm. some point. Okay. Is there a particular thing you're looking, can I, can I just ask you for what, so that it helps me maybe provide another? Because I want to know, I, I'm, I'm, I, and I know sometimes when you're driving, we're out, you know, looking at the animals and I understand that, but the actual driving from location to location, the, you said the furthest distance may, in one day was eight hours or? Yes. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's the one location from, to the Yeah, that's from Murchison Maction Falls to Kibali. And that is like that's one of the days that's really a drive. I like that that's we have a little bit of a game drive in the morning, but for the most part that's a that's a transfer day um to get to Kibali. But that's and like the the, that's the biggest transfer day. Okay. And then the other one was a 6-hour transfer. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then and I would say our, you're like of the 12 days and maybe Lori, are you, I'm thinking maybe four, I'm just, I'm trying, I'm trying to think the average, average driving is going to be five or six hours a day. Average. What do you, what do you think, Lori? Oh, you're muted sister. Let me uh, try it now. Uh, I can't hear you. So, okay. yeah, the, um, it, like one of the things for me this year, just to let you know, I got, I became, I, I became aware of driving times because I got a blood clot and not from driving on safari. Um, but in September of 2020, I got a, I got a deep vein uh, thrombosis in my calf and I did a long road trip from uh, I went out West after we did our Idaho trip, I rode down to you through Utah and then Colorado and came home to Chicago. And, uh, I did a couple of 10 and 12 hour days. And so I got a blood clot. So now I'm mindful of how much people get out and walk. Uh, I wear compression socks also. So that's kind of also why I was just wondering, um, you know, about that, you know, just, you know, you know, the purpose of your question. Also, there's plenty of opportunities for bathroom breaks too. Um, I, there, the bathrooms, uh, I have a supplemental information uh, link on the website, shows you a picture of the bathrooms. It's Uganda. I mean, they're, and they kind of like an Indian influence. So the, um, the, the floors of these bathrooms are basically holes in the ground. Um, so you don't expect a toilet um, for the, the, the roadside stops at your bathrooms, at your lodges, it's regular toilets and stuff. Thank you very much. I appreciate you answering the question. You're welcome. I have another question. Sure. Um, what 
Um, how long does it take to get the tourist visa? A couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, yeah, and you shouldn't do it. Um, you can't. You you actually can't even purchase it online more than three months in advance. I always have people do it starting about sixty days before travel to purchase okay. it online. It's it's so easy to get the visa. It's just kind of a couple of like technological things, like to have a picture of your yellow card, a picture of your passport, have those things ready, uh, like in the right place so they can be uploaded to streamline the process. Um, but it's it's very easy to get it. Okay. Lori, I can see you talking, but like it's just coming through, just, but not, I don't hear your, your voice. I'm so sorry. Everyone should know. Everyone will probably know Lori at some point. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Any other questions? These are really good. And they also help me understand kind of what you're look like just some of your concerns too. And you're, you know, booking a trip to Uganda. I'm signing up. <laughs> Hi, Patty. Hey there. Who else is going? <laughs> if yeah. If you're going, raise your hand. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Awesome. All right. There. I'm going, I'll be there. I'll be there. I got to change that booking link like stats. I'm going to do that as soon as I hang up with you guys. What's some of that stuff? I just, I think at the top, yeah, I, 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 all the best laid plans technologically, I'll fix it. Um, good. Any, like anything else? Thank you so much for being my first Zoom presentation of 2021. Boy, that was stressful, but you all were nice and friendly and I hope I covered everything I needed to cover. Um, and you like the pictures and you're going to have your own amazing photos and you're going to fall in love with that place. Like I do. And the, the joke is that, that will, uh, well, the joke is like the, the worst part about going to Africa is going to Africa. It's because you just want to keep going back to Africa. <laughs> uh, it's like, it, yeah. Yeah. So I know Patty has been, uh, to Kenya and Tanzania. Um, anybody else here been to Africa is it, or is this first time? First time. Tanzania. Wait, where'd you go? Time. It, Debbie, or have you um, been no, I, this is, it's my first time. First time, great. Yeah. And it was an amazing first time too. People, like, it's kind of like when people tell me they went to Costa Rica, I'm like, like I feel, I, I just have bias, right? Because I'm like, no, you haven't been to Costa Rica until you do my Costa Rica. That's kind of how I feel about Uganda. Uganda feels like Africa. It feels like a National Geographic experience. Uh, Tanzania, I love. But I, I feel more like Teddy Roosevelt on some romantic, like, you know, like, I don't know, the Serengeti is a totally different experience. You can come for that presentation next. Ah, all right. Well, I'm, I guess I'll sign off here if, if you guys don't have any more questions. Thank you so much for all your great questions. And you. Uh, you know how to find me. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Good night, everybody. Right. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.